that we're seeing um, um, now really um, um, significant moves um, by legacy media to try and prepare for a, a big battle um, with, with digital platforms. So um, the growth of Netflix is now being met by multiple horizontal and vertical consolidations um, um, in uh, 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 essentially entertainment media. Um, uh, Disney and Fox, uh, AT&T um, buying uh, Time Warner being examples of that. And the, the attempt here is to bulk up and in a sense to consolidate libraries and consolidate franchises like Marvel and Pixar with the hope that, that by controlling that high quality content, if um, um, as it were their own streaming services can be launched, you've got things of the scale needed, it's believed now to take on Netflix. It's significant that Rupert Murdoch um, uh, ca cashed in his chips, not thinking that, that 20th Century Fox was big enough. I mean, this is a world, it's really important to say, a, a world where the Murdoch empire judged itself not to be big enough to compete. So that's, that's where we are, 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 are there. Um, unfortunately, in news um, in the US, and arguably here as well, we're seeing an even more overtly defensive consolidation, increasingly with, with private equity money uh, uh, and hedge funds coming in to tr simply try and run down these businesses by consolidating and cutting costs. And I think, with, I think with an assumption that there's cash to be had for them for some years, but they're all going to be driven into the ground. Um, and and, I, I, and, I, I, and that, the straightforward result of that is, you know, literally thousands of journalists uh, losing their jobs and almost every day newspapers going, going out, of, out of business. Um, however, I mean, I would say, and the, the Times has been, we've been leading this at the Times, the, the notion, which is the most elementary notion of all, which is that if you make really high quality content, uh, which is relevant and valuable to consumers, that they, they will value it and they will pay for it, and that actually digital gives you a chance of scaling that. Um, I think actually the most simple, simplest business model of all is the, the model of the the cobbler who makes a good pair of, of shoes, puts them in the window and sells them to somebody. Um, that, that's working well for us. I mean, we've now, as of today, get, got around four and a half million uh, subscribers. When I arrived, I think it was closer to one and a half million, so three times as many subscribers. Um, um, we think there is a multi-billion dollar market uh, in high quality journalism. Um, we've done this, I mean, I, I quite often, I mean, The Guardian, uh, understandably, often makes a big fuss about the fact they haven't got a paywall. Um, I think that goes right back to the beginnings of a, of, a, of a kind of notion about the internet, that you either have a wall or you don't. We've got a kind of porous model. We, we have 140 million <coughs> unique users every month, of whom 135 million look at journalism without paying us a penny. Um, our, our model um, depends on trying to encourage people to to get used to our journalism, to come to rely on it, and when they want to look at a lot of it, then to pay. Um, and whenever something big happens, like a you know a hurricane or a, uh, indeed an election, um, we tend to take the model down completely and let people consume as much as they want. So mm -hmm. I think that there was a kind of first era internet debate about um, the freedom of the internet versus you know um, like uh, tight wall subscription models. I think we're playing in the middle ground and actually. That's working for us very well. So our, our revenue's growing. Uh, we remain very strong and profitable. Um, we've been steadily hiring journalists. We've now got 1,600 people in our newsroom. Uh, we've, we've built out a 32 foreign bureau. And we expect to hire more journalists this year. So we are um, absolutely at a time when most people are um, firing journalists and reducing. We're doing exactly the opposite. And I, I think, in a way, I think of our strategy as being closer to, to that um, uh, employed by, for example, Reed Hastings of, of Netflix, which is, you know, in the end, great content is always going to be in demand. And if you invest and build more, which in our case means more investigative journalism, more international news. So I mean, we're, we're, we're doing things which are often in the, in the UK media debate regarded as being very virtuous and the, 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 the likely subject of market failure. But at least in our context, with our very big home market and our global opportunity, it's turning actually to be a, a very good commercial strategy as well. Yeah, so you've got this sort of flight to quality. And yeah. certainly the New York Times as a brand can 
do that, the FT can do that, maybe the Wall Street yeah. Journal, maybe a few others. Do you think that's possible for existing media brands in the UK? And sort of in that flight to quality, you know, what happens to the rest, the long yeah. tail? So, so the, the puzzle, I think, is, 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 again, I mean, just to put it in kind of economic terms, is that the, um, the, the amount of, of, of revenue uh, and the amount of likely margin that you can derive from a, a digital user, even a digital subscriber, is likely to be a lot less than you would get from a print subscriber. Yeah. Um, or indeed a print, you know, print advertising is worth more per user than, than, than digital advertising, print subscriptions, typically more than digital subscriptions. So the number of engaged digital users has to be much larger. And the big question for, for media in, 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 in the UK, but also every other European market, um, including really quite large markets like Germany, is can you get enough uh, engaged users in your home market, and if not, what global potential do you have? And unfortunately, in most of the developed world, by the way, very much to include the United States, the majority of the media is essentially parochial and domestic. It's inward looking. Um, it, it's never really sought to build its brand or to um, uh, make itself attractive uh, beyond its shores. And that's a problem. Um, uh, the American entertainment brands see a lot of talent, particularly in the UK. Yeah. Um, but they're very much aiming at, at kind of directing that towards global audiences. And that's a very different model. And I think there's, there's two issues with that. One, how do you compete with that when your competitor has got a global audience and global economics and you've only got domestic? But secondly, how do you stop your own talent um, um, being sucked up by the big global players? It's no longer kind of Madokian. It's no longer a kind of Madokian dystopia where you kind of you know, it, there's a kind of political edge to it. These are much more colourless. They're not interested in UK politics. I mean, Comcast, which now, you know, owns B Sky B, is not interested in sort of, you know, the finer points of who to back in Brexit. That's not their business at all. But the the risk that you start getting a creative agenda and a, a kind of a agenda of expression, which is, which is focused on uh, global audiences and on the US, is great. In Orwell's, um, in 1984, if you remember, Oceania, which is the kind of American yeah. global power, um, calls Britain Airstrip One. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a, a, a slight risk with these gigantic streaming uh, companies and all the rest of it that you, you, you get exploited and the fabulous talent in this country gets exploited. But the idea of, as it were, you know, self-expression of British talent first and foremost for British audiences, begins to get eroded. So how does, how does the culture of the British newsroom need to change to respond to that? Because part of this is, is the economics, but part of this is the, the, the kind of culture of journalism in this country. So honestly, I still think that most people in most news organisations are talking about doing digital rather than actually doing it. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it, it's... I mean, everyone now, I mean, you go to any media organisation in the world and they say they've got a fantastic digital strategy. I mean, so everyone has got this kind of pitch about how they're transforming everything. And I would just say, in almost all cases, it's simply not true. I mean, it's unbelievably difficult and disruptive to kind of turn a news organisation around. And with really painful... Um, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll give you one example. At the, at the New York Times, we... Um, we had an advertising sales department, and, and let's say we had 350 people, and it's probably actually rather more now, probably about 400 people now, but 350 people. And, um, but people who were entirely set up really for, for print advertising, which is a very simple task, particularly with the New York Times. Historically, you know, the phone rings and you take a, a booking for a full page ad in the New York Times. The, the future is just completely different. You have to go out and um, sell your wares, you, you need things like you know, branded content, sophisticated digital sponsorships. The, the, it's a different world. And although we've done our best with retraining, between 2012 and 2015, we, we swapped out 85% of that department. Um, I mean, the, you, you, the, the difference of skills and expertise you need is astonishing, even in your newsroom. In, in the newsroom over the last five years, we've probably seen about a 40% um, uh, swap out. Uh, uh, um, and, and so the, the kind of gut-wrenching scale of the challenge, most media organisations, I think, are not um, even beginning. I mean, I, I went to a conference and heard an Italian newspaper publisher last year saying, you know, this digital business is getting, is getting really serious. So We're going to have to start thinking about home delivery of our newspaper. <laughs> you know. So if you, if you take... <laughs> 
if you take um, uh, when you look at Europe, right, from from looking yeah. over in the states, I, I always felt the states are always a bit further ahead on these disruptions. As you look to Europe, who do you see as a as a leader, and who do you see as a laggard uh, in the European media environment? In some ways, the Germans and the Scandinavians have have have, have thought hardest about this, and um, I think, and um, both uh, digital subscription, but also. Um, 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 for example, hanging on to their classified advertising businesses, right. uh, uh, not letting the classified advertising be taken by other entrants, but, but playing quite an aggressive role in trying to hang on to that business by re completely reinventing what the business was. So Shipstead and Axel Springer in particular. Um, and uh, uh, although the Germans, I think, have got this issue of they're, they're, they're sort of stuck in Deutsche Tum, they, 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 uh, they're, they're also quite high barriers to entry. Um, and also a great tradition of, of, uh, of, of German newspaper reading, which is important because the print platform, the print platform is probably not going to be with us. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of legacy platform for your news, but it's darn useful in terms of, of throwing off cash, which right. you can then use to, to invest. invest in digital. Because the other obvious point about digital is it's fantastically um, uh, um, uh, cash intensive in terms of, of building it out. So I think the, Ger the, the Ger Germans, Germans are um, in a very good shape. I think countries, Italy, I'm afraid, an example where they, they really have a very strong tradition of great regional newspapers. Um, um, it's very, very difficult to scale to the economic. There are some national newspapers, Corriere della Sera and La Repubblica will be considered national newspapers, and La Stampa is read widely as well. But it, it's very hard for them to get the scaling. And bl bluntly, um, you know, the, the, the cultural issues in Europe of drastic organizational change and cultural change, um, that, that it's, just, it's just tougher. Uh, it, uh, one cultural difference with America is people are more up for kind of reinvention of a, of a business than, than I think is, is, e is easy in, in most European countries. Very much so. I want, I want to turn to this question of tech. I, I recently spoke to one of the world's top investors, and what he said to me was, um, tech is laying waste to all that stands before it. I'm seeing that across multiple industries and sectors, that this is a sort of phenomenon across the economy. Um, in this era of accelerating change that you speak to, has public policy kept pace? And, and what do governments need to do differently? Well, the answer, the answer to the first one is, is, is kind of manifestly not. It's very hard, by the way. And, and yeah. I mean, there's no point in human history where regulation has kept pace. And it's quite hard to figure out how you would keep pace without actually making terrible mistakes and intervening and stopping intervention. So I think there's going to be some kind of lag. Um, I think there are some really good examples. I think, I mean, you know, the ones who members are here, I think the DCMS um, uh, Select Committee is a really good example uh, um, of a very thoughtful group yeah. of people asking, you know, big, questions. big, que big serious questions. And that the, the, the evidence um, uh, they took, uh, the public session they did taking evidence in Washington, D.C., was cited by many people in America as, you know, why aren't our politicians asking questions like that? And why aren't they, why aren't they, you know, kind of trying to get... So I think there's some really good examples of some policymakers asking the right questions. But, uh, but if you look to um, particularly um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's um, sessions in the, in the Congress, in the US Congress, so arguably to some extent his sessions in front of the European Parliament, um, the kind of woeful lack of... Um, uh, knowledge and I, I went in to see a, a senior person in the European Commission last year to talk about GDPR, the the data regulation, and uh, I started off on a kind of rant uh, about how something which had been you know originally intended probably to hold the to, to control the major platforms was uh, uh, was actually likely to hit European and indeed other publishers, essentially because the platforms are very 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 powerful um, uh, first party data most. Publishers are also very reliant on the third party use of data. And this, this very senior person with a direct responsibility to GDPR said, could I stop you? Could I stop you? Um, could you explain to me what first party data is? <laughs> uh, and, and then, in fact, actually, could you draw a, um, I'll, I'll get you a bit of paper, could you draw a, a, a diagram of how digital advertising works? 
So, yeah. so you sometimes have these kind of jaw-dropping, you know, and it, I mean, to be fair, you know, these, these are people with a million other things to worry about. This stuff is unbelievably finicky and difficult to understand. But there's a, 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 a kind of gruesome gap at the moment between the reality of the rate at which our world is changing and policymakers' ability to understand it, let alone, as it were, figure out what to do about it. Yeah, my, my sense is that the Cambridge Analytica scandal was a watershed moment, not yeah. just because of the political implications of the yeah. particular um, question at hand, but more because I think it was for the first time for the public on both sides of the Atlantic, yeah. that moment where people said, well, hang on a minute, maybe these large platform companies aren't wholly benign and providing yeah. me with something yeah. for free that I value. Maybe that they've got their interests ahead of the public yeah. interest. And that's what has sort of turned... I, I agree with that. Though I think Cambridge Analytica, it's quite interesting. I think there's a, there's a, there's a risk here of unintended consequences. Um, um, uh, I, I had a chat with Mark Zuckerberg a couple of weeks ago. Um, um, and Mark's current view is... Um, and he wrote a blog a few days later, um, um, is essentially, I mean, I mean, these are extraordinary companies. I mean, apparently he's been going around Facebook saying, we mustn't be sentimental about Facebook. We may need to change our business model fundamentally. So let's not, let us, Facebook, not, yeah. not be stuck with our legacy business, Facebook, you know, 2004 or seven or whatever it is. <laughs> um, uh, and his thesis seems to be around building a, 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 the new kind of area for concentration, at least, if not actual switch, is around private messaging. Hmm. Um, so something close to WhatsApp. He calls it the digital living room rather than digital public space. And I think at least that's partly with the notion that you keep, you, you have a, a, an entity where um, users use it, their, their first party data um, goes into the entity, enables them to, to, to communicate with their nearest and dearest, but, um, you know, this is the kind of response to Cambridge Analytica, nothing ever comes out. Right. So it's a one-way filter of data into the entity. Yeah. And it never comes out. So therefore, you're never going to have your data um, uh, exploited by Cambridge Analytica or someone else. Well, that kind of sounds good, but that, that's not the complete story about privacy. The idea of an incredibly powerful c company with the, all of the data of two or three billion people and, you know, what are they doing with it? They may not be sharing it, but what are they going to do with it? And I, I think... And how that, are they going to monetize it? Uh, how are they going to monetize it? But, but crucially, it seems to me... I mean, and, um, one book I recommend to people is Tim Wu's new book, um, uh, 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 The Curse of Bigness, which is, is essentially is about antitrust and the need for a return to antitrust is... Um, this is not just about consumer disbenefit and the fact that individual consumers, in a, in a sense, might you know, be sort of trading their data for too little money. So there's a kind of market failure in an in implied barter uh, um, exchange of data. It, it's also, more fundamentally, this is about democracy and power. A and the power that goes with a, a strategy... It, I'm, to be fair, I'm, I'm speculating about what, what, what Mark's got in mind, and we'll have to see what he's got in mind. But, but, but the, the, the risk is of a, of, a, of a world where you have private companies with a pattern so far of extreme secretness, who, who have got the same kind of approach to data that Xi Jinping has got in, in the People's Republic of China. Yeah, I mean, so l last September, we published the, the final report of the IPPR Commission <coughs> on Economic Justice, and uh, it, it got some attention. Justin Welby was one of our commissioners, yeah. Francis Grady from the TUC, Dominic Barton, the global head of McKinsey, array of, you know, people from civil society, from business, from trade unions, sort of all coming together on this commission. And one of the big themes coming out of it was this idea of open markets and shifting the basis of regulation of competition policy from a very narrow idea of consumer welfare into a much broader concept of the public interest and thinking about innovation, entrepreneurship, and the implications for democracy. In that report, um, we proposed creating something called Off-Digi, so the Office of Digital Platforms, and introducing utility-like regulation for digital platforms. Is that an idea that you think has some merit? And, and where would you see the sort of regulatory regime well, heading? I think, it's, I, 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 think it's, I think it's... I think it's an interesting idea. Trying to figure out what are the right tools here needs some work. I think classic, classic antitrust uh, 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 intervention um, uh, to look at whether essentially big, 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 very big companies should be 
broken up um, or um, uh, should have specific remedies put in place because of, of, of their scale and the risk of market abuse is, is not to be dismissed, as it were. Uh, and the US um, uh, uh, law in this matter is actually very potent and powerful. The issue in the United States is since the, the Robert Bork uh, Chicago School yeah, exactly. uh, thesis uh, took over, they've chosen not to, not to do it. The Microsoft deal is the, la uh, the, the case is the last significant intervention, uh, not just in this, but in any area by the Justice Department. Um, so firstly, I think classical um, antitrust um, uh, uh, um, pro-competition um, uh, interventions make a lot of sense. Why, actually, not to slow the digital revolution down, but on the contrary, because I think competition theory suggests that if, you, if, if you've got multiple companies competing, you're likely to get more innovation yeah. uh, uh, and more consumer choice. So I think there are very simple reasons. That's important. There, there are a whole set of content uh, regulation issues. Uh, what I do think is, if, if it's determined that a given digital company is literally a utility, if you decide that essentially there are reasons to believe that there's really only going to be one powerful search engine and its utility, then I think the idea of classic utility-style regulation makes sense. Um, that's not the only possible outcome. Some of these, some of these platforms uh, um, are, um, have got strong characteristics of, 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 of utility. Some of them feel more like powerful content platforms. Um, platforms. The other com com complication, of course, is in many ways all of these companies are um, digital advertising companies. Um, yeah. And that's their real business, as it were. They, they don't really like to say that because digital advertising, I think, rightly hasn't got a particularly splendid reputation. But that's, in a sense, the fundamentals of how they work economically. Indeed. If, I mean, if you frame the question as uh, how do you think about Google, this fantastic tech company, uh, or how do you think of Google as the world's largest yeah. advertising company? It takes quite different places. I mean, in the report, we argue for a new approach to competition policy that actually revives some of the traditional tools. So yeah. market concentration yeah. questions like you just described, so overall market share and should they be broken yeah. up. Um, vertical integration, is it right that Amazon both is the marketplace and sells its own brand products within it? Those yeah. kind of questions. Yeah. And price discrimination, of course, we know that Facebook uh, charged a lower price to Trump-associated campaign adverts versus Hillary-associated campaign adverts in 2016. Yeah. Um, and so that's quite a rich theme, yeah. I think, for debate. It's, it's worth saying that all of these guys, I mean, most of these companies um, genuinely are doing things which we would regard as being incredibly valuable and positive. I mean, it's, it's quite easy in this moment, having had a kind of utopian period where they were wonderful, to flip completely. Um, yeah. Google's opened up advertising to small enterprises in a way which has really driven business in a way which wasn't possible before. Facebook is a very valuable channel to the New York Times for selling digital subscriptions, which pay for high quality journalism. And I think the other thing is, I think part of a more sophisticated and more kind of current approach to the big platforms would also not now attempt to demonize them. This is the thing, yeah. we need a kind of new, more mature relationship with these guys. And by the way, the other companies which don't exist yet, which are gonna come alongside them, this is not over yet. There's no reason at all to believe that this current sort of set of companies is, is what the world's going to look like in five or ten years' time. I think history suggests it won't be. And most incumbents tend to like regulation because it erects new barriers to entry. That's Very right. interesting. So finally, before we open up for some questions, um, I wondered if we could turn to matters of this parish uh, and the BBC. Um, obviously, there's the consultation on the BBC's uh, licence fee, yeah. and particularly funding the over 75s. So I wondered yeah. whether you uh, think that makes sense, and do you see a new era where the BBC has a role in poverty alleviation and social policy? Well, I, 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 I've got a very simple, classical, and I have to say totally loyalist view of the BBC, which it's there in the end to serve the whole public. It, it's critical that it's a universal provision, that every single person is worth the same to the BBC, um, economically, but also kind of spiritually. And uh, it's one of the places where this country can kind of come together. Not necessarily, by the way, to be united, maybe to come together in all its divisions, but that's that, and that's that, and the idea of simple excellence across everything it does is is what the BBC stands for. And you know, it's no secret I I, I um, fought against um, the uh, idea about the over 75s um, that um, benefit being. The, the, the money the government was paying for it being, being taken away, so the BBC was going to shoulder, shoulder this. I fought against it um, in, in 2010 and indeed um, was in the throes of, of resigning as Director General 
when eventually the government at the last minute changed, changed its mind and decided not to impose that on the BBC. And I, I was so against it because it seems to me it's simply wrong in principle and horribly difficult in practice to uh, impose on the BBC um, uh, decisions and uh, uh, the execution of social transfers, of, 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 of making the BBC you know, responsible for part of the benefit system. I just think it's the BBC, in terms of its own accountabilities, um, is not set up in the way that Her Majesty's government and parliament is set up to, to deal with the trade-offs there. And um, I, it was a, um, a, a past chance for George Osborne. I could absolutely see why getting you know, three quarters of a billion dollars off the books helps balance, balance the government's books. But it just seems to me it's, it's, it's problematic. Uh, I, I don't envy, I mean, I think the BBC's got an excellent set of leaders at the moment. They have some fairly momentous decisions to take on this topic in, in the coming weeks. I don't envy them and I haven't got any advice for them. It, it seems to me it's the wrong place. See, and it's easy for someone who's not there to say. It's the wrong place to be grappling with do you take a benefit away from some people? Uh, do you leave it? What do you do with enforcement if someone's had a, a free license fee for many years? They don't qualify because they earn too much. Uh, you know, how hard is enforcement? Do you send them to jail if they won't pay? Th this whole world, at a moment when the BBC should be concentrating on the digital revolution, how do you respond to the demographic um, pressures, um, the loss of younger audiences? How do you begin to compete with a, a, the, the world of Netflix and all the rest of it? It's a horrible distraction, and the risk is, really through no fault of its own, you, you make the BBC itself, you put it into the front line of one of the most contentious and difficult areas of, of public policy, and you end up you know, with the BBC losing some of the trust of the public, um, as I say, to repeat, not through its own, its own fault. So, I mean, that's my view. Yeah, and intergenerational inequality is obviously a very difficult issue to to tackle overall, it does. It and one of, the, one of the biggest threats of the big streamers and, and of, of digital media as a whole is, is, is this business of losing younger audiences. The biggest single threat, I think, to legacy media around the world, very much to include the BBC, is the loss of, of as it were, audiences under the age of 40. Yeah. Um, that is an absolute existential battle, it seems to me. That, in some ways, that's the, almost like the best single lens for looking at the challenge. And one of our um, main at, um, focuses at the New York Times is how do you how do you think about that and how do you counter that and I'll give you just one example our podcast the daily has become very successful most successful most downloaded podcast on iTunes last year the daily which is a, a daily um, uh, news based principally politically news based podcast um, reaches a different audience two third three quarters of that audience is under the age of 40 nearly half is under the age of 30 those are new people you know, different medium, different, different kind of mode of consumption. Those are new people. We're launching a TV show, again, on a, a younger skewing cable network in a few months' time, again, with the idea of trying to broaden the, the, the catchment, broaden awareness of our brand. Of course, the risk for the BBC is that the only people who watch it are the people who don't pay for it. Um, and it does... But yeah, yeah, they're not quite there yet, but... But seriously, directionally, directionally, that's the risk. Right. That, you, you, that you, end up, uh, 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 you end up in this really bizarre situation where younger people, of poorer younger people, um, who are not using the BBC very much, um, end up having to subsidise wealthier older people who are getting an awful lot of value out of it. So I think there are really... And that, the thing about the whole 75 thing is each year the demographics of the country make it worse. Yeah, exactly. it, it's, a, it's like a time bomb. It get, get, each year it gets worse. Every bit of it gets worse. And to pick up on that, I mean, last, last week we had the spring statement and uh, seeing the distribution analysis quite interesting. So I think it's that uh, overall the bottom 20% of households end up being £100 a year worse off. And the top 20% of households end up being £280 a year better off. That's the impact of last week. Yeah. Um, and, and then secondly, of course, last week there was an announcement, you know, austerity is over. And this week, it sounds like it's austerity for the BBC. And I, I wonder whether the political moment has been missed uh, for imposing a big cut on the BBC's budget. Well, let's, I, mean, I, I, I mean, again, I, 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 I won't speculate on that. What I do think it's worth saying, though, is that it's very easy to think that this is, um, um, you know, this is a piece of discipline being imposed on a, um, a public sector organisation 
uh, where they can just jolly well tighten their belt sort of thing. It's really important to say the modern BBC, so much of this money flows through the BBC into the creative sector. Um, the, the real risk is, you know, that you end up with a kind of a further kind of squeezing of a sector which, you know, in my simple head anyway, it, it's like in a kind of, what should we call it, a trans-Brexit UK, uh, as we're going through that process. The creative industries are one of this country's global success stories. The BBC, by the way, is by far the most important global media brand the UK has, by far. Um, is this the right moment to, 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 to put the squeeze on that sector or on the BBC? It seems to me it's complete, if, if you are someone who believes, and I think you could, be, you could believe this whether you're a Remainer or a Lever, if you believe in a, in a global UK and you believe on getting British talent, British ideas, British intellectual property to the whole world, I, it's hard to find out that wonderful anyone in the Brexit debate who disagrees with that proposition. Think yeah, I mean, carefully about how you invest in that sector. Yeah, I mean, in Prosperity and Justice, we describe the BBC as actually an element of industrial strategy as a way to think yeah, of it, yeah. as a kind of repository of capability and talent. I've always, I've always thought that. And, think, and things, like the, things like the movement. It's not an accident we're so successful in that. I, I've always thought that side of the BBC, I mean, one of the reasons for the move north yeah. to Salford was, was precisely because you, you, you can, there's no reason why you can't use the license fee both, as well, the same pound to make, both make a pound of great content, but also a pound of useful industrial intervention with hopefully the idea that you're going you're gonna to provoke other investment to happen. Fantastic.